Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salam ala Rasul al-Kareem Assalamu alaikum everyone uh, I just wanted to mention briefly thank you very much for the organizers for setting up this event uh, it's really a privilege to be here I'm sure the rest of the participants feel the same way and inshallah we can emulate and proliferate these activities back home inshallah which is what the ultimate goal of this session is inshallah so um, I'm just going to quickly introduce the um, summary of my presentation. So this is part kalamic and part philosophical. Part philosophical because um, the work that I'm taking involves a Christian philosopher by the name of William Dembski, who I'll introduce later on. And part of it is to reevaluate some of the presuppositions that we've had from our tradition. And hopefully we can create a synthesis where we can merge and create a novel uh, neo-kalam, inshallah. So this is the uh, brief overview of my presentation. So um, in order to understand the novelty of William Dembski's contribution to information, what I wanted to do was first highlight how different authors preceding him have tried to define and identify information. Following that will be an expose, a brief expose on Dembski's contribution, and then I'll have a very brief Kalam interlude, at least um, highlighting the specific topics that are of interest to me uh, for making this synthesis and then hopefully be able to stitch that in the Neo-Kalam, inshallah. Right, um, if you go to the literature on information theory, uh, people have tried to identify and define information through various ways, and there are three very broad lens, um, and these uh, broad lens are also um, accepted by Keith Ward, who's a very famous philosopher, as well as John Pudfoot. So briefly, semantic is basically the study of language. So there's a whole idea that we have these symbols, we have these sounds, and they're recognizable within a certain community. And through that, we have informational exchange. So this presupposes a community, presupposes minds that are able to have that sort of transfer. Semiotic information is to do with the study of forms, and this is largely to do with Aristotelian forms. So this desk, for example, is made out of wood, but it has a certain shape, it has certain properties attached to it that give it a certain hylomorphic character, and that's a second kind of information. The first two are largely qualitative, uh, but the third one is very distinct in that it's quantitative in nature, mathematical information. In fact, the founder of information theory was none other than Claude Shannon, who in the 1950s and 60s, um, he wanted to try and devise how we can send information efficiently from sender to receiver. And he identified something called the Shannon information. So just to give you a, a quick example, if you have two sentences and they have the same number of letters in each one, but the first sentence is semantically loaded. For example, it, has a, is a, it conveys a certain meaning. Whereas the second one is just a randomized letters. It has no meaning whatsoever. From a semantic point of view, this would be meaningful, this would be meaningless. But from Shannon's point of view, because it's quantitative and he wants to know how much data you can transfer, both of them would be equivalently meaningful, at least from a Shannon perspective. So those are the three large, broad stroke characterizations of information. <laughs> With that in mind, I want to introduce William Dembski. William Dembski is a Christian philosopher, and he's been negatively uh, bombarded uh, by philosophers, scientists, and theologians because of his affiliation with the Discovery Institute. For those of you who aren't aware, the Discovery Institute is pretty much spearheading the ent entire intelligent design movement, and he's one of the main proponents of that movement, along with Stephen Meyer and Michael Behe. Now, unfortunately, there's a lot of good work that he has done, uh, particularly his metaphysics, that I think, unfortunately, gets brushed under the same rug. And I wanted to try and take some of those viewpoints and hopefully be able to creatively use that for Kalam. So what does William Dembski say? So this is his, his book, which I'm mainly referring to, being as communion, the metaphysics of information. He defines information as a very interesting principle. He defines it as an act of exclusion. And what do you mean by this? Say, for example, somebody asked you, what is the weather outside like? Now, there are a range of possible answers, potential answers that you can give. But the moment you posit that it is raining outside, you've simultaneously not just positively asserted something, you've also excluded all the other possibilities. So it is this act of actualization from this possible world narrative. So he's obviously largely very influenced by David Lewis's work on the possible worldview. And he identifies this possible matrix set as the matrices of possibility. And within this, this matrix of possibility is a very malleable and flexible thing, which is what makes it one of the most insightful uh, metaphysical worldviews that I've come across. In the sense that you can scale it to whatever object that you desire. 
Coming back to the rain example, if you wanted to go further, let's say for example, I said it is raining, but I've also said now it is raining three inches per hour. What I've done is I've excluded further possibilities by specifying more information. So this act of exclusion is something that can be scalable not just to the weather, you can scale it to buildings, tables, anything. Now obviously you can see where I'm going with this. Imagine if we can scale this to the entire cos cosmos. It, the fact that God is not just recreating, he's actually excluding other possibilities for the actualization of one. And this is primarily my argument here, that I think we can use this and incorporate this in Kalam, inshallah. Uh, suffice to say that because he is a Christian philosopher, he believes that all these possible worlds narrative, at least however many they are, they are in the mind of God. And it is God who actually actualizes each and every moment in time. Right, for those of you who are more visually inclined, this is a quick sketch. So if you have all the colors in front of you, the matrices of possibility, so you have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. If I posit one, I, s I select specifically one color for a specific object that I want, in the same action, I have positively asserted and also excluded the other colors. So this is the, the visual uh, mechanism by which Demskin is arguing for. And uh, the, the reason why his perspective is so novel is because it, it undergirds all the other definitions of information that I was discussing earlier. Now, quick Kalam interlude. So a very rough sketch of uh, the world of Kalam is simply two things. One, that there is this idea of discrete time, and two, there's the idea of discrete space and matter and, and all the sorts. Combine these together and you get this discrete worldview, uh, which is the Kalamic occasionism, as I like to call it. Now, this was an attractive worldview because we wanted to avoid the idea of infinite regress. Um, if you keep on magnifying and there are an infinite number of constituents in the world, what this implies is that you get some contradictory assertions. Shlomo Pines, in, in his book, he says that if you have a seed and if you have a mountain, and if they can be divided ad infinitum, then you have a clear contradiction. For that reason, um, having a discrete worldview was a necessary uh, and I think most viable option that we could have entertained. Coming now to the more nitty gritty details. So obviously, this is a bottom up approach. Since we have adopted a discrete worldview, they had to have some foundation in how to understand these fundamental constituents. I don't like to call them atoms. I, I resonate with Dr. Basal Tai because I think uh, atoms are very preconceptually loaded and I prefer to call them fundamental constituents or fundamental units. So when the Uryam of the Kelimun decided to discuss about these fundamental constituents, they had this interesting taxonomy where you had this idea of a joha, which is this continuance of, uh, of, of like a sort of a substrate, an indivisible substrate, um, that once it occupied arab, any sort of properties, it comes into concretion. So as an example here, here you have that indivisible body. Once it combines with the arad, material length or color, you get a certain output, wood, centimeters, blue, whatever variation that you like to give it. Now the problem is, now I found historically that the Mutakellimun, at least the early Mutakellimun, they had a lot of debates on what are the properties of the substance and what are the properties of the arad. It was not a homo homogeneous uh, perspective. They differed on some of the natural entities and some of the descriptions of each one had. Furthermore, they also disagreed on how many of these fundamental constituents come up to make a body. And this can be found and traced in Shlomo Pine's work, Harry, Harry Wilson's work, as well as Mahmoud Bulgin, who is publishing a book with KRM. Uh, now, why did I raise this up? It's because what I want to say was that the Mutakelli Moon, they were completely hypothesizing what these fundamental constituents are, completely a priori. Now what that results in is that if we have this metaphysical commitment to such a worldview, it can have some potential conflict with modern science, particularly in light of new quantum physics where the I traditional understanding of the atom is completely diminished. To give an example, um, this is known as the complementarity principle, which I, I'm sure Dr. Basatai um, can allude on later. And uh, these are two different um, subunits. So if you've defined position very well, you lose um, resolution on your velocity according to the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. By the same token, if you fix your velocity, you lose resolution, uh, resolution on your position. And what that does is, is that the ontological reduction, this idea of being able to have a clear and systematic analysis of these fundamental units was the goal of the Mutakelli Moon, but we have a, some sort of epistemological fuzziness in being able to get a complete characteristic understanding 
of these fundamental units. Now, how does this link with information theory or Dembski information? What I suggest is that rather than having a completely definitive understanding of these fundamental units and building a metaphysical worldview bottom, uh, bottom up, I suggest we invert that and say that we can minimally postulate that there are these discrete entities, but we should add signs and hints from nature to tell us how far we can exclude our matrices of possibilities, rather than having an a prior assumption and doing it beforehand. Otherwise, it can lend to a very suffocating metaphysics, and it can really um, sort of neglect or sort of uh, suffocate even the scientific explorer space that it needs. The second area where I think uh, this idea of information can be uh, fruitful is um, understanding regularity and also irregularity. Now, as I said, if you think of this momentary recreation from an informational perspective, each and every moment is simply an act of exclusion by God. And here we can explain regularity by saying that God is excluding the same actualization. So if I drop this, and it drops, and it drops again and again and again, God is allowing that conservation of information to take place. But by the same token, when we have the idea of miracles or violations of nature, as modern philosophers like to call it, then that is simply a different act of exclusion. Both, metaphysically speaking, are absolutely accommodating from this metaphysical perspective. Uh, and to give you a brief example, I've sort of uploaded this. I don't know if this will work. Yeah, so if you see here, this is frame by frame, a wooden stick turning into a snake. Uh, and the connection between this and Musa al is quite obvious. So I personally don't see, from a metaphysical perspective at least, that there's nothing wrong in God converting any of these things into another thing based on different acts of exclusion. As you can see, each frame has different outputs and it's excluding different things and eventually converges into a snake. The other area where I think information theory can help us, at least, is with the whole enterprise of emergence. For those of you who are unaware, um, emergence is a rival position to reductionism. Now, reductionism is predominant science, and it is the belief that the whole can be completely defined by its parts. So if you take any macroscopic object, and if you zoom down, zoom down enough, and you understand its constituents, you can explain the whole by its parts. Emergence, by opposite, is, is, is in complete contrary to that it believes that the whole is more than their parts. And one of the examples that they use is this sim uh, simple chemical equation. And I know chemistry is a long time high school thing, but I'll try and make it very simple. So you have these two chemical reactants, sodium and chloride, uh, chlorine, and they react together to form sodium chloride. Now what's interesting here is that neither sodium as an individual element nor chlorine as an indiv individual element have the properties of saltiness in them whatsoever. But somehow, when you combine them together, in that comes the fruition of the quality of saltiness. Reductionists will argue that this is simply the derivative of these new uh, molecules that have come up and they just have the property of saltiness. Emergentists argue in response to that and they say, no, all you have done is you have simply correlated a physical characteristic of this molecule and this property of saltiness. But what you have not done is explain the origination, the momentary origination of the quality of saltiness that has come out of this reaction. I believe that, uh, at least from an informational perspective, this is a resolvable issue. If God allows when these two atoms come into proximity with one another and they form sodium chloride, God can easily add that quality in a different act of exclusion. By the same token, God can put any property he wants on it. He can make it taste like sugar, make it taste like chicken, whatever we want. So, and this, this resonates even with Imam Ghazali's opinion where the idea of fire, um, where Ibrahim السلام, when he was thrown into fire, it didn't have that hot effect anymore, it had that cooling effect. So for those reasons, I believe that information theory, if combined with kalam, remember I'm not discrediting kalam at all. All I'm saying is that we have to have a minimum postulation of this atom and be able to have a top-down approach rather than a bottom-up approach. To summarize my argument, Dembski information is an act of exclusion and it's coming from the top rather than bottom up. And it therefore loses any pretenses that we are supposed to have of these fundamental constituents. For those reasons, it gives the following benefits. Number one, it nullifies the need nor the, the, the digression to go into the accident substance debate. Number two, it is not overly prescriptive and therefore allows science the explorative space that it needs to be able to flourish. Number three, it accommodates miracles and also emergent properties. And number four, 
it safeguards Allah's absolute power because that was one of the main tenets of the Ashri school of thought that we have to explain uh, God's absolute free will and at the same absolute power and free will and at the same time be able to explain some of these scientific endeavors and so-called miracles or violations of nature. That is my talk. I really hope uh, you benefited. I look forward to your constructive uh, feedback. Thank you. Thank you.